Well, I praise the Lord, even though we live in a land and in a time of sinking sand, we have a solid rock on which to stand. Let's stand together as we sing this hymn. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Let's build our hope on him. Darkness. shall come. says he drew us up out of the pit of destruction and he set our feet on a solid rock. We understand this side of the cross and the resurrection, that solid rock today is Christ and we will stand on him and his promises in our life. Gives us the ability to praise him. Even if we had a thousand tongues, we could never have enough to be able to declare the praise of our great God. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise.
that we can sing his praises. Would you be seated where you are? Denver is such a beautiful place, but it's a very lonely place. People are just looking for community. There is one marijuana dispensary for every 2,000 people, one brewery for every 7,000, and one evangelical church for every 32,000 people. And the Lord has just like softened my heart to that, and I'm like, I have to go. A journeyman is a recently graduated college student who then serves for two years in a city to help support the church plant that needs help um, and needs more resources to further their mission. And so my biggest thing as journeymen is relationships, taking time to hear someone's story and hear what needs they have and just like be friends with them without a hidden agenda. Like with PlaceBridge Academy, which is a refugee magnet school, there was people praying that there would be strong believers come into that community and reach them. We actually found out that one of their community directors there at the school is a believer, and she was the door into letting us come in and serve their community. We are reaching 40 different countries in one place. There is so much work to be done and so few laborers to help do it. Like that's why I pour my heart and soul into these mission teams. If they can just like catch a little bit of vision of what's going on here so more of them will come. I felt like it was just yesterday that I was a college student and I gave God this blank check and truly gave up control. And he's brought me here. Brianna's story, it should resonate with us, but the question that she, or the, the statement that she proposed just a moment ago when she said, I gave God a blank check. I'm smiling right now. How many of us have done that? Giving God a blank check says, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And so people like Brianna who have accepted the call in the journeyman program, which the journeyman program through the North American Mission Board is a very unique ministry for college students who maybe quite don't know exactly still what they want to do or they want to go serve for two years, gives them an opportunity to serve in cities like Denver and other metropolitan cities across North America. And so by you and I giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, we are able to help students like Brianna serve on those fields to help those church plants on the front line. And so we've been taking up our Christmas offering, not East Christmas offering, but our Easter offering. I do that every time. Our Easter offering uh, since the first of uh, the of the month. And I just got an update just a little while ago. Our goal is $10,000. As of right now, we're just over a little over $6,000. So we've got about this week and uh, the next couple of weeks just to kind of finish that up. So I want to challenge you to, to pray about how the Lord wants you to give specifically to that Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And let's meet our goal for 2022. Now, as we continue to turn our hearts and minds to worship, if you've been reading along with us in your Rooted Journal, you know that every week we have a memory verse. In week 17, our memory verse is from Psalm chapter 23, verse 6. And the word says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I love it when God brings the plan together because we're going to talk about some of these issues as we finish out the book of Ruth this morning. And so we want to think about as we pray this morning about this goodness and mercy. Does goodness and mercy define your life right now? Does it define who you are, where you're walking right now? Because the scripture says it will follow us all the days of our life. God has our best interests in mind. In a dog-eat-dog type world that we live in, to know that God has our best interests in mind is a very comforting thing. And it says that we will dwell in the house of the Lord. We can take rest. We can take comfort in his promises, in his sovereignty, and in the providence of God. And forever, that means eternity, that we can enjoy our relationship with him, not only in heaven, but we can begin enjoying that right now today. So let's begin praying this way this morning. Father, this morning I'm thankful, God, for your goodness and mercy that is ever present. Lord, even when we cannot see your hand working, we know that you are working on our behalf, that your goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. 
As your children, Lord, you give us great and remarkable promises. And Lord, we're grateful, Lord, that you pursue us. God, that you desire to know us. Father, I wish that we could always say the same thing about us and forgive us for not pursuing you. But Lord, we're grateful that you do not give up on us. But God, you pursue us and you follow us. And Lord, we're grateful for the promise this morning that we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can rest. We can take comfort in this goodness and mercy that is following us all the days of our life. And to know that those promises are available for eternity forever, as your word says. But Lord, I'm grateful that even today, on this side of heaven, Lord, that we're able to enjoy that goodness and mercy. And Lord, as we gather together today, as a family, God, may we be reminded of these simple but yet profound truths. God, that you are good and that you love us. And that you have our best interest in mind. And Lord, as we continue to worship this morning, as we sing the songs, Lord, that you've you've given us this morning, as your word is open, as we walk through it here in just a moment. God, continue to draw us to yourself. Do a work in our hearts that can only be attributed to you. And Father, it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Declare our dependence on the Lord. Lord, I come. I runs deep. Let's call on the name of Jesus. 
the only name that has the power to raise the dead. Sing this with us. presence to declare your great praises, to sing our praises with, with the tongues that we have in our mouths. Even if we had a thousand of them, God, we could sing your praises over and over again. Thank you this morning that the object of our worship is not us, not any circumstance around us.
Father, the object of our worship is Jesus. Only Jesus. We give you glory, great glory. And it's through that name we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, we begin our final message in our series as we've walked through the book of Ruth. We've taken about three weeks off and with the Easter schedule and kind of put that aside. But today we jump back in in the final message of the book of Ruth. And starting next week, we are going to jump into the book of James. If you haven't read the book of James, I want to encourage you to, to go home maybe this week and begin reading through that. Uh, and if you've not read James lately, it will be a reminder quickly that he throws punches really fast. He will hit you in the mouth, he will hit you in the gut, and he will get in our face. And so looking forward to that, we'll be through the book of James all the way through the month of September. And then starting October 1st, we'll jump into something else. But today we finish up our series called Redeeming Love. And this message, I want to focus specifically on God's invisible hand at work. Like all good stories... It has a hero, and we know the book of Ruth has a hero, and our hero uh, Boaz marries Ruth in the book, and they are blessed with a son, and when a baby comes into your family, either by birth or by adoption, it is a blessed event. It doesn't matter if you have one child or seven children, they are a blessing. But today, we are going to learn about the blessing of one grandchild specifically. And so that may be foreign for some of you. It's a little foreign to me, but uh, it is what it is, and we'll get there, and you'll see how that will all fit in. And so for each of these messages, I've kind of given you a 36,000-foot overview of the story, the full story, so that you can appreciate what's going on here. And some of you have heard that plot about six times, but maybe for some of you, you're here for the very first time. I want to tell us the summary of the book of Ruth one more time. And so we know in a country far, far away, there's an Israelite family who leaves the city of Bethlehem looking for food. And it is ironic that Bethlehem means house of bread. And so they travel to a pagan land by the name of Moab. It's a place where the children of Israel had been before. They had been persecuted there. It was not a place that was good to them in the past. But they go back. This family does. And the father's name was Elimelech. And the mother's name was Naomi. And it was supposed to be a short trip. But that short trip turned into a 10-year-long stay in that land of Moab. And so their two sons that they took with them married Moabite women, which was forbidden for the Jews. But tragically, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies there in Moab. And not only does Elimelech die, but so do her two sons. And finally, after three funerals, the light begins to come on. And Naomi says, hey, let's go back to Bethlehem. I hear they have bread there. Let's, they have food there. And so she urges her two young widowed daughter-in-laws to stay put, stay with your families. And so one of them, by the name of Orpha, she stays. But the other daughter, by the daughter-in-law, by the name of Ruth, commits herself to Naomi. She commits herself to Naomi's God. And she returns to Bethlehem with Naomi. That's a, that's a good daughter-in-law there. And so when they returned, there was a problem though. They were poor, very poor. So poor in the fact that Ruth has to go out into the, to the fields and be a beggar. And she goes into the field of a farmer by the name of Boaz. And she goes into his field to be able to pick up the leftover grains that were there. And Boaz begins to take notice and begins to see her character, her diligence there. And so he instructs his workers to leave a little extra so that make sure that she has enough to be able to feed her and Naomi. But Naomi starts putting context clues together. And she realizes, this guy Boaz, I'm supposed to know him from somewhere. And she realizes that this Boaz is actually part of her deceased husband's family. And not only is she part of the family, he would be one that would qualify to be what was called a kinsman redeemer. And that meant that if Ruth married Boaz, they could legally reclaim the land that formerly belonged to Naomi's husband. 
So Naomi, what she does is she begins using her matchmaking skills and teaches and coaches Ruth up a little bit about how to approach this guy by the name of Boaz. And we know from several weeks ago, one dark night at the threshing floor, Ruth courageously, courageously asked Boaz to be her kinsman redeemer and her husband. And Boaz emphatically says, yes, I will be your kinsman redeemer. I will be your husband. But there's a problem. The problem is, is there's one other fellow. There's one other fellow that's a closer kinsman redeemer than I am. And he would have first rights of refusal. And we know from a couple of weeks ago that the scripture never tells us that guy's name. Actually, in the Hebrew language, his name is Mr. So-and-so. And so Mr. So-and-so says, hey, I want the lamb. But then he finds out there's a, a bride that comes with it. He's like, uh, that's going to mess things up. That's going to complicate things, particularly with my other wife. That might not be a good idea, right? We don't know if she's married, he's married or not. The scripture doesn't tell us, but it's probably a good chance that he was there. And so Ruth is married to Boaz. Boaz becomes the kinsman redeemer, and God blessed them with a son by the name of Obed, who turned out to be the grandfather of King David himself. And so God redeemed Ruth from a life of poverty, a life of loneliness, and made her a woman of honor because one of the, and becomes one of the human ancestors of Jesus. But we also don't want to lose sight of this. Even though this is a remarkable story and there's plots and there's characters and things like that, this is also a love story about how God redeems our lives as well. And so that's kind of the full story, the 36,000 foot view. Let's, let's narrow in here in these last few verses of the book of Ruth, starting in chapter 4, verse 13. Listen to what the word of the Lord says. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went to her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is far more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he was the, the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the genea generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadad. Amenadad fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. So we see this story coming to a close here. And what we want to understand is this, is that God works himself. God, God basically two ways God works in the world. The first way that God works is that he works through miracles. And when miracles happen, you know that God's hand is present, right? You know that he is involved. But the second way that God works is, is through his providence. And this is when you can't see God's hand. It's invisible, but God is still at work, even in the midst of those situations. And when God performs a miracle, he's front and center. But when he works through his providence, he's, he's in the background lingering the whole time. And to understand the, the providence of God, we kind of got to pick that word apart for just a minute. Pro means over. And, and vidence, that portion there, the root that we get that word for is to, is to watch over. And so we know that when we watch a video, it's something that you watch. And the providence of God means he watches over the affairs of our lives. But God is not a casual spectator. He's not a casual spectator. He is active in this world and in our lives. And to put it another way, God is sovereign. It means he rules over history. Now, in the book of Ruth, there aren't any outright miracles that we see there. There, there are not any there, but it is filled with the divine fingerprints of God's invisible hand at work. And in the same way, God is working in your life. He's working in your life. Sometimes what we think that are simply just random events are actually the invisible hand of God working to guide us towards his goal for us, to make us more like Jesus. And in case you didn't know that, God's goal for us is to become more like Jesus. That's what his goal is. 
And so what we want to notice here this morning is, is how God was working in the life specifically of Naomi, Ruth, and even Obed. And then we're going to learn how God is working in our lives this morning. So let's first learn the Naomi lesson. Here's the lesson for us. God still cares for us even when we're bitter towards him. Now, some scholars have even said that this book should probably not be called the book of Ruth. It should be called the book of Naomi. And here in the final verses here, our attention is redirected to Naomi as she holds her grandson on her lap. Her name means pleasant. But if you remember back in chapter 1 Ruth of Ruth, uh, after they returned back before they, when they returned back to Bethlehem from, from Moab... She was full of bitterness. And she said in chapter 1, don't call me Naomi. She said to them, call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And as we've talked before, Naomi represents a Christian who wanders away from God and then returns. And it, but it's actually the, the disobedience of Elimelech to leave God's land and to leave God's people that produced this bitterness in the first place. But she didn't say that. She, she directed all of the blame towards God. But here at the end of the story, she has changed her name again. She, she now said, don't call me bitter, but basically call me grandma. That's what she says. And as she looked back, she can see the long and twisted road of her life actually has brought her to a good place in life. And that's the providence of God at work. When a miracle happens, you recognize it immediately. But you only recognize the providence of God in your life as you look backwards. Even though she blamed God for her misery and, and bitterness, he never stopped loving her all the way to the end. He blessed her more than she could ever have imagined and we do the same thing. If we're honest, and we're all honest people here this morning, right? Amen? Ooh, that was sad. We are all honest people in here, right? That's still sad, but we'll keep going. When our lives are sometimes miserable, we shake our fist at God. And we complain, why have you made my life so bitter? It's all your fault, God. Maybe you've said that. Maybe you haven't said that. Maybe you're thinking, I haven't said it out loud, but I've thought about it a time or two. Well, in case you didn't know, God, God can read our minds too. And, but he's a big boy. He can, he can handle those type of things. Even when you are bitter, his love still cares for you. He loves you. He cares for you. You may be where Naomi is in, in, in chapter 1 here. Your blessing gauge may be on empty. Your bitterness gauge may be, be full. So what can you do? And what do you do in those processes, in those times? You trust him. You trust him. And so here's our action plan for the Naomi lesson. The action plan is this. To extend your life, start investing yourself in future generations. <clears throat> Now, for some reason, even Christians have bought into the secular psychological lie of this doctrine that they call self-esteem. And just think about those words for, for just a moment. Who is getting the attention in that doctrine? Self. Self. But here's the reality. We were not designed to be so consumed with ourselves. Our depravity has taken over. And it's no wonder our lives can become bitter. When we're only thinking about ourselves, it drives us to dark places. And that's when we come face to face with our depravity. And friends, it's not pretty. I'm going to say this and some of you are going to disagree with me, but stick with me. God is not foremost concerned about your happiness. You know why? Why? Because all of that's dictated by your circumstances, and it can change just like that. But he is concerned with your holiness. And it's when you are chasing after God, 
You are longing to see him, longing to know him. It's when we begin to get that correct understanding of life. Instead of being full of self-esteem, let us rest in the security that comes with Christ's esteem. Our identity is not wrapped up in who we are, but who he is and what he has done for us. And that never changes. It never changes. Naomi, she found happiness in caring for her grandson, Obed. Look at chapter 4, verse 15 again. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Now, we often will use the expression getting a new lease on life. And maybe you've used that before. That's exactly what we find happening here with Naomi. She gets a, a new lease on life. And she has a purpose in life and caring for her grandson. And it's obvious from these verses that Naomi did more than just watch Obed. She became the baby's nurse. She was Obed's full-time sitter. She had a second chance at parenting. Now, we don't know what kind of mother she was to her sons who passed away, but they had lived in a foreign culture. They had married women from Moab. But now, here's Naomi again, and she has a chance. She has a chance. She has more age. She has more wisdom. She knew better how to train up a child in a way that he should go. And I'm sure that she told him about how she and her family left Bethlehem, made the mistake. And traveled to Moab where she met the mother Ruth. And I'm sure that she told little Obed the story of her grandmother, Rahab, other grandmother, Rahab, and how she had helped the spies at Jericho. Obed grew up knowing that he was a special gift from God. Now, how many grandparents do we have here today? I'm going to keep my hand down. I'm not a grandparent yet. I've been told, I don't, I don't know this for sure, I've been told they are grand because they are grand when they come and they are grand when they go. Is that right, grandparents? Yeah, somebody was honest up there. Thank you. All right? And so they are grand when they come and they're grand when they leave. I've heard other people saying things like grandkids are God's reward for not killing your children. Is that right? Or I know if some grandkids were, some people have said if grandkids were so much fun, we'd have had those first, Right? There's a lot of things like that. But when you're a parent, sometimes you're just in survival mode. You've been there, parents, where you're just trying to survive. We had three in about three years. we we'll give a little bit of take. And I've told you guys this before. We were strung out. We don't remember a lot of it. We had so much going on. We, we can't remember. And I think that was kind of God's way of sparing us a little bit, sparing us some brain cells and other things and traumatic injuries and things like that. We love them, and we are grateful for them. I won't tell you what I said in the first service. But anyway, we'll talk about that later at lunch. But as parents, you're just in survival mode. You're just trying to survive. But grandparents often have the time and the wisdom to invest in the lives of the grandchildren. I've watched some of you do that, and you've, and you've poured your lives into your grandchildren. I admire you for doing that. And if you're a, you're, you aren't a parent or you aren't a grandparent, you, you still can make the, 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 the difference in the life of a child. Listen to me. We always need help in the preschool department. I hope every one of y'all just got convicted about that. We need help in the children's ministry department. And as I told the first service, don't ever let me hear come out of your mouth. I done my time. God never retired anybody. I'm serious. We, we need your help. We need your help. And so if that's not going to work out for you, you've got local schools here who would love to have some volunteers. Pour your life into people who are younger than you. I had my college guys here on the front row in the first service. They bailed on me in the second service, just like good college kids. But uh, on Wednesday night, I've got a small group of college kids, the guys that I meet with, and they just, they just ooze life into me, getting to spend time with them, the energy that they have. Now, I have to corral them sometimes because they're college kids, and you just kind of have to put them together. But pour your life into another generation. So we see the Naomi lesson, but here is now the Ruth lesson for us. All the resources of our Redeemer 
are available to us. Ruth is a picture of a new Christian. She was a stranger from a foreign land, and now she has become the part of the family of God. And the reality is, is all of us are strangers and foreigners to God until we accepted his grace and trust him to be our kinsman redeemer. When she married Boaz, she received all that Boaz owned. Everything he had was available to her. Now, can you imagine one morning Ruth is now leaving the house and Boaz is saying, hey, sweetheart, where are you going this morning? And she says, oh, I'm, I'm just going into the field and I'm going to glean a few handfuls of grain so that I can prepare some bread for us later on. Can you, um, can you, can't you just hear Boaz saying, what are you doing? Don't you know I own the field? I have barns full of grain. All that I have is yours. You don't have to beg anymore. I am yours and you are mine. And all I have is all you'll ever need. And you see, when you and I become part of God's family, everything you need is available to you. But the sad thing is, is that too many Christians are living like spiritual beggars. Instead of claiming what is already ours in Christ. And I love the promise from God's word in Romans chapter 8 verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Notice those last two words. It doesn't say some things or most things. It says all things. Every resource of our heavenly father is available to us because of our love relationship with him. And so what is the action plan here? The action plan is this. Instead of begging God for blessings, start claiming his promises. Start claiming the ones that he's already given us. Boaz would have been insulted if Ruth returned back to the fields as a beggar. But it seems that Christians, we often take the role of a beggar particularly when it comes to the area of prayer. And I love what Ray Stedman says. Ray's written a lot of stuff. And he says this, I imagine that the Lord Jesus looks at us sometimes in amazement and says, what are you doing? Why do you keep coming to me asking for the thing that you already have? Why do you ask for strength and grace and joy and peace? I've already given you all this. All that I am is all that you need. Why keep begging for that which you already have? If we begin to walk out upon this, uh, this mighty transforming truth that God has given us here in the book of Ruth, that we are now married to him who has risen from the dead, married to the man of strength and of wealth who has given to us all that he is and all that he has, our lives would be transformed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And in verse 11, he says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And the reason that God blesses us with all the blessings that we need is because he wants us to share those blessings with other people. He wants us to be generous in every occasion. We are blessed to be a blessing. We aren't beggars, but we are blessers. And so we see the Ruth lesson. But thirdly is the Obed lesson that we learned this morning. And the Obed lesson is this. God is always working to accomplish his plan. God's plan is to redeem and to rescue fallen creation. We are all part of that. He does it any way that he wants to do it. But sometimes, and in this particular case, he does it by bringing a baby into the world. Obed was born in Bethlehem, and, and he would be the grandfather we know of King David. And so when we come to the genealogy of Obed, we begin to see God's invisible hand at work here. So why did Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem? Because God knew that in the future a descendant of Ruth would be born in Bethlehem and his name would be called Jesus. The lineage of Jesus runs through David. So 1,300 years later when Caesar Augustus in Rome just happened to levy a tax on the entire Roman Empire, everyone had to return back to the home of their family. 
Joseph and Mary were descendants of David, so they just happened to be required to visit Bethlehem. And it just happened that Mary was pregnant at the time and the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. And in our story, Ruth just happened to be gleaning in the field of Boaz, who just happened to be a kinsman redeemer. These weren't random coincidences. They represent the providence of God, his invisible hand at work. There is no irony with God. And as you look back on your life, you can see the hand of God at work. But the problem is, is we must live our lives forwards and not backwards. But God always sees the end from the beginning. But only when we get to the end does the beginning make sense. Does that make sense? Well, maybe it does. Maybe it does it for you. Here's what I mean. When we read a book, we start at or watch a movie. We we start at the, the, the beginning and we move towards the ending. But when it comes to history and the future of the universe, God doesn't need to look at it that way. God sees the whole thing at once. In fact, the Bible says, I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. So how many times in life have we looked around and seen things happen We just can't explain. We wonder what in the world is is God doing because it sure doesn't make any sense to us. The problem isn't with God, it's with us. We don't have enough sense for the sense of God to make sense. It's who we are. We may not know what is in the world is going on, but God does and we should learn to trust him. There's an old saying, God is too wise to be mistaken. He is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hands, trust his heart. God has your best interest in mind. He always has and he always will. So here's the action plan. Look around and see where God is working and join him. God was in the process of redeeming Ruth, and he's graciously allows Boaz to join him in this complete work of redemption here. And the key verse that we see here is in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, when it says, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, who's, who, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth. Take shelter under the comfort of the wings of God. Then Boaz became the one who gave her the shelter and the security that she needed. And God wants to use you. You realize that? The God of the universe wants to use you. Yeah, you. He wants to use you to help someone to find salvation and redemption. He's in the process of redeeming people of every race, of every culture, all over the planet. He may not be doing it the way that we think he should be doing it, but that's not our call. Our job is to join him in his work. He's working all around us. Jesus says, my father is always at work to this very day. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. John 5, 17 and 19. Look around. Open your eyes. Get your eyes off yourself and look around. God is changing your lives all around us. Look around as you head out to work tomorrow, while you're at your workplace, when you go to school tomorrow. Look around you. God is rescuing people, and he wants to graciously use you and me to be his instrument to bring about this redemption. Now, there are people that say, and I've heard them say it before, maybe you've said it, that the Bible says that God moves in mysterious ways. You heard that before? The only problem with this is that that's, that's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Bible. But to us, it does seem like 
God works in mysterious ways, right? He does. On the other hand, there was a man by the name of William Cowper, who was a poet who lived in London in the 18th century. And he struggled with bipolar disorder, although it didn't have a name back then. And he even spent some time in an insane asylum. Well, he got off in a bad way. He wanted to marry his cousin. His dad told him, no, thankfully for good dads in your life. And so he slipped off into despair, deep despair. And twice at the age of 32, he became so depressed and disgusted with living that he tried to take his own life. He overdosed once on a narcotic medicine of the time, but he survived. But one dark night, he hired a horse-drawn cabbie to drive him to a bridge that crossed over the Thames River, and he intended to jump out and to jump off that bridge. And as they left, a, a thick fog began to descend on London, and the cabbie drove around for an hour, never, never to find that bridge that he was looking for. And so Calfer was frustrated and he gets out of the carriage and he decides that he's going to walk himself to the bridge. And he found, to his surprise, as they had driven around, that they had actually driven in a circle. And when he got out, he arrived right there at his doorstep. He ended where he had begun. And William decided that night that God had a hand in the fog. So his entire perspective changed. And he never attempted to take his life again. And although he continued to struggle with depression, he later looked back on the foggy night and he wrote a poem called Light Shining Out of Darkness. And that poem later was put to music and it was the hymn that we now know that God moves in mysterious ways. And here's what it says. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Now this is good. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. For years... Calfer feared that God was angry with him. He was afraid that God was sending him to hell because of his sickness and his failures. But by this time, he'd come to realize that those ominous storm clouds were actually full of mercy. And he saw that what he thought was the frowning face of an angry God was actually a loving God who was smiling at him the whole time. And I want you to hear something this morning, friends. I want you to hear God loves you and he is orchestrating things in your life that you cannot see. But instead of running away from God, run towards him. It, it may not be answered and he may not answer in the way that, that you want him to answer. Praise God because I've known my prayers. God is always in control. He's not off duty. Now, the story of Ruth, that's a happy ending, doesn't it? It started off with nomads and ended up with a people at home. It, it started with funerals and it ends with a wedding. It started with death and it ended with the birth of a baby. It started with poverty and it ended with contentment. And it started out with bitterness and it ended up with a sweet taste of God's, God's providence and his provision. And as someone redeemed by our kinsman, Jesus, we are assured that our lives are safe and secure in the palm of the hands of God. And that promise and the promises that we in, see in Scripture are available to every one of us in this room and to all. But we also know that salvation is not cultural it means that redemption of Jesus is available to all those who believe. It's not automatic. You're not just born into it. It's a decision that every one of us in this room have to make between us and God. You can't make it for your children, and your parents can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. It's something that you have to decide between you and God. It's a personal relationship because it's between you and God. 
Now, our faith walk was never meant to be private, but it was meant to be personal. So I want to ask you today, where are you? Where are you? Have you come to that point in your life where you've trusted Christ as the Savior of your life, the Lord of your life? Because it's only when you do that can you understand the promises that he's made and you can begin to live life the way God created you to live. And until then, you're on your own. And you're spinning in circles and you're only getting deeper and deeper. But the hand of grace, the arms of grace that were spread wide upon the cross invite you to come to experience life and life everlasting. And maybe today you're here and that's what you need to do as we have our time of response here in just a moment, as we sing our song of response. Maybe to you, for you today, you need to, to trust Christ. Maybe he's drawing you to himself don't turn him away today. But some of you may be like William Calford today. You're living life in this haze of confusion and turbulence. And maybe you think that God is mad at you. But here's what you need to understand. His goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. We can dwell in the house of the Lord forever friends that is the hope that we have there is no hope anywhere else but the hope that we have through Jesus is perfect it needs no more updating it needs no more critique it's perfect and the hope is available to you let's pray together father thank you this day and this morning for the hope that we have. Father, I am grateful that you are orchestrating things in my life that I cannot see because, God, I don't have enough sense to ask for it. But, Lord, in your great mercy towards us and your great love towards us, God, you are moving and you are working. Father, help us to turn our eyes off ourselves and run to you. And, Father, I pray for that one who's here today who's never trusted you. God, that you would draw them to yourself today. God, that today would be the day that they surrender their life to you. But, Father, I pray for my fellow journeymen, if I, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as we journey together. Lord, we know that this world can throw things at us that will confuse us, that will put us in a, in a fog. And, God, today we want to claim your promises of mercy and grace to remove us from those things. God, we know that it's available through you. And God, today we want to claim those promises. And Father, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So friends, as we sing this song of response, we're going to sing an oldie but a goodie. It's a very simple, simple hymn. I surrender all. And I've said this to you before and you will hear me say it again to the point where you're sick and tired of it. As you sing this hymn, don't you dare sing it if you don't mean it. You hear me? Don't you dare sing it unless you mean it. Because if you sing it and don't mean it, that makes you a hypocrite. So that may mean that you need to repent this morning. There's some things in your life that you need to do business with God this morning. But if you can sing that, you sing it to the top of your lungs. Let's stand together and sing this morning.
sometimes as pastor, I can make something that's a conviction of mine and try to make it and force it on you. And that song, the reason why I said what I said is that it's always been a conviction to me to sing that hymn because, man, those are, those are some tough words to, to sing and to sing them with honesty. And so I, I, I try to take those things seriously. I am so glad that you're here. You know what? He is still risen. Now, we can find the other 150 people who were with us in the 1030 service last week. We'll be doing good, won't we? He is still risen, and he's going to be risen next Sunday, too. Amen? So we're glad that you're here. And if you're a guest with us, there is a connection card in the pew rack in front of you. If you're in the balcony, they're on a table in the foyer. If you'll take that, fill that out, and take it right out of here to our next step center, they will trade you a goodie bag for a filled-out connection card. Want to get a record of your attendance so we can get to know you a little bit better. There are a lot of things going on in the bulletin this week. This is one of the first times in a while we've had to make cuts. We had so much stuff to pull in the bulletin, we didn't have have room, but we've got graduation stuff coming up in a couple of weeks, scholarship stuff coming up in a couple of weeks. There's somebody's got a birthday party. I don't know who this guy is, but he has a birthday party coming up soon. <laughs> love you. I love you. But anyway, that's coming up soon, pay attention. But there's two things specifically I want to call your attention to. Camp for students. Wednesday is the deadline. If you have not registered for camp, Wednesday is the deadline. You need to take care of that and do that today. You can sign up on Realm or you can talk with Tyler. He'll make sure that you get registered. But also, uh, if you've been a guest with us or you're a new member or you've uh, been here a long, long time, the next two Sunday mornings during the Sunday school hour, we're going to have what we call our entry point class, which is kind of a new members class. And so we're going to do that for the next two weeks. We'd love for you to join us. If you have questions about our church, that's a good way for you to get questions answered answered. Uh, just kind of know us a little bit more who we are, how we operate, why we do what we do. And uh, we'd love for you to be our guest. You can go to our website, firstbaptistellisville.com, and you can register for that. I want to encourage you to please register because we've not set the location on campus yet. It's all dependent upon how many we have is where we're going to meet at. So we need to know those numbers as far out as we can. So lots of things going on. Pay attention to your bulletin and you will do well. In our first service, we had a special time to pray for, for Jay Sullivan this morning. Uh, many of you know that Jay's been on a transplant list for a kidney for a long time. And so they're probably maybe close to being on the road right now headed to Birmingham. He's got some really crucial doctor's appointments first thing in the morning and hoping that uh, those appointments come out like they need to come out so he can take that next step to be closer to getting that kidney. So we had a chance to lay hands on uh, Jay this morning and pray for him. And we're going to pray. For, I want you to pray for him uh, throughout the week, him and Arlena, as they travel back and forth. And so let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning for your mercy and for your grace that your goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And we thank you for that eternal promise that we see in your word. And Father, may when we don't understand, instead of running away from you, may we run safely and securely into the, to your arms, your arms of love. God, thank you for my church family, a chance to gather again today. Lord, I'm thankful uh, for, for Jay and as they continue to travel today, Lord, give them traveling mercies. And Lord, we pray for these doctor's appointments and that his body will respond the way it needs to respond so that he can have the relief that he needs in his life. God, we are so grateful and we thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.